Um, cool. Morning, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm trying to get my head together. And I'm always amazed by God's graciousness and patience towards us as His children. <laughs> that even when we're distracting, when we're full of nonsense, when we just don't want to listen, He still lavishes us with His love. Amen. He still loves us he, and He's with us. And it always blows my mind when I look at my children that don't want to sit still and they drive me mad. Um, and, and how very often that's how we all sit in church. The same restlessness, the same when is lunch, the same when is the song is over. And God still graciously inclines Himself towards us and overflows His goodness towards us. So even though as I stand up here a bit distracted by everything this morning, I'm overwhelmed by God's goodness and patience towards us as His children. Amen. And, and, and this morning as we, we tackle sexuality part two, if you were here last week and you intentionally came back today, well done. Um, if you didn't know what we're speaking about again, I'm sorry. Um, so yes, and, and we're going to have communion today, but we're going to end with communion because we really believe God's heart for us in this tough topic as we wrestle through sexuality, as we wrestle through how do we engage with people, is that a lot of us carry hurt from past sexual experiences. A lot of us carry either abuse or misuse or confusion revolving around that. And God's heart this morning isn't to bring shame and condemnation, it's to draw closer to us. It's to love us, it's to encourage us, it's to say, I'm with you. So that's where we're going to hopefully land a little bit later at the table. Um, but if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open to Genesis 3, 1 to 5. And I'm going to start right in the beginning. I'm just going to read where we, we picked up off picked up with or ended off last week and, and just unpack as we said today we're going to unpack the second part of how does the devil deceive us into believing that which isn't good is good for us right because the devil's the second person in the bible to use the word good and he starts to manipulate it and use it in such a way that we start to question the goodness the authority the awesomeness of god Right? Any obstacle, any decision we face on a daily basis that goes against of the Word of God, it's a battle of, is God to be trusted or is my heart to be tr trusted? Right? If you, if you think of any temptation or difficulty or crossroad you faced this week, it was that. Which has ultimate bearing in my life? That which I feel or that which God declares? Right? Uh, um, whatever it is, whether it's a, um, any aspect of our lives. So Genesis 3, 1 to 5, and then we'll open in prayer. And we'll circle back around to Genesis 3 a bit later. Genesis 3, 1 to 5, reading from the NLT. Uh, Jericho was sick today, so there's no PowerPoints today. So just take extra notes. Or if you want, I'll email you my notes. But Genesis 3, 1 to 5. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say? Right, there's that doubt. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any tree, trees in the garden. Of course we may eat trees, uh, may, may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die? The serpent replied to the woman, again with that, right? What's the worst that can happen if we don't go to church? What's the worst that can happen if we do what we want to do, Right? Clouds our mind throughout the week. What's the, ugh, if I miss the Bible today, it's fine. If I miss prayer, if I miss home cell, if I miss connecting with the community or the Word of God or listening to the Holy Spirit, what's the worst that can happen? Right? Anyone had a week like that? You're in good company. Eve knows your pain. So you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God. Right from the beginning of creation, um, Satan wants to be like God. And his temptation to man is that we too can be God. We can be rulers of our life. We can be self-sufficient. We can not be dependent on anyone else. He says, you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. In other words, remember last week we looked at God defined what is good by his creation. He said, this is good. He judged. This is good. He judged. There's a design and a, and a, a, a purpose behind everything that he does that is good. Satan comes and says, hey, we don't need to listen to God. It's like when you're in high school and your friends came and you, your friend said, let's go to this party. And you're like, no, my dad said we couldn't go. You don't have to listen to your dad. Right? And whatever ensued after that decision of disobedience was normally debaucherous. So we see this. Satan's coming to Adam as sons and daughters of the Most High God and saying, we don't need to listen to your dad. And, and the challenge this morning is, who are you listening to? Yourself? or your dad, your heavenly dad. Let's pray.
Well, the Lord, we just come before you this morning and we thank you for your love and your mercy in our lives. We thank you for your patience, that you are slow to anger, you are quick to love. So this morning we want to sit under that love, sit under that grace, sit under your provision, Lord. That as we sit here, we know that we have a good, good Father as we've sung. That we surrender all to you, Lord. Whatever weight of distraction is weighing down on us right now, Lord, the distractions of the week past, the week forward, the month-end distractions, whatever it is, Lord, we just want to say, Lord, we lay it all down at the foot of the cross. That we invite the Holy Spirit to open our ears, open our hearts, to hear exactly what it is you want to teach us this morning, Lord. Because we believe that you have a word for each and every one of us. Lord, it may not be about our sexuality and it may not be about those things. But you have a, an aspect of your heart that you want us to take hold of today. So Lord, speak to us, we pray, Lord. Speak, your servants are listening. Lord. Commit this to you in your name. Amen. So I've said we, we carry on with tough topics and we're doing sexuality past, part two. Last week we, defined, God, we said God defines what is good, not humanity. That, that if we want to know what is good for our lives, what is pleasing to our lives, we go to God, not to culture, again and again and again. And, and we looked at that sex was instituted only after the first marriage we see in Genesis 2. We see God's design that He makes it's not good for man to be alone and He creates a woman, a partner for Him. And, and as they enter in, then only after they, they orchestrated in husband and wife does sex enter into the picture. And we saw how many times we could say sex last week, if you were here um, and it got a bit uncomfortable, so we won't go down that road again. But, but, but that God has a design for us, both in our sexuality and how we relate to the world, that is not dependent on how we feel or culture, but based on who He is. Right? There's a design for us when it came to sexuality and how we engage with culture and the world that is not dependent on what we feel or what we want, but on who He is as our Heavenly Father. And that the primary issue when it comes to sexuality is not about sexual expression, but about unbelief. Right, we kind of touched on this, the goal of, of abstaining from any sexual desire that we have outside of the confines of, of, of marriage as instituted, we believe, in Genesis 2, is about an unbelief that God is sufficient and worthy of laying down our, our, our own desires before His. Right, so, so it wasn't the, the goal of, um, if you have same-sex attraction, isn't marriage, it isn't having a heterosexual relationship and having children, it's an unbelief that God would be sufficient despite what you feel, what you desire, right? And, and we do not hold to the, we, we, we struggle, or we challenge with that we don't hold an authority of Jesus in our lives, right? We have everything else, culture and feelings above all else. So Christ came to rescue us, not from sexual expression, He came to rescue us from unbelief to belief, right? Whatever you're going through, whatever struggle and, and beyond sexuality this morning, it's an issue of, is Christ sufficient? Christ wants to rescue us, He wants to redeem us, whatever it is. And we'll see there's lots of decay that enters the, wall, or the world from the fall. And, and He wants to rescue us from an unbelief that that is how it's meant to be. Right? Um, and, and it has an impact on every area of our lives. And, and that repentance is not calling you to turn towards self, but towards Him. Right? Culture says just take care of yourself, look after yourself, put up big walls, especially if anyone's moved here from Joburg, the first thing we did was put up a wall. <laughs> right? It's just what we do. And culture continually says that about our feelings, our emotions, who we keep close to us. But, but Scripture again and again calls us to be vulnerable, to be community oriented, to be engaging with one another. So repentance calls us towards His people, which is the church. We believe God instituted the church as His people to draw us in for community, for better or worse. Um, and, and that's why this, this week I was reading or, or just thinking about marriage and, and all the different marriages. And, and one of the things is for better or worse, right? And, and one of the metaphors the Bible uses is between God and the church. And the church is the bride and, and the church is a family. We marry together for better or worse, for ups and downs. When we disagree, when we aggravate one another, when we annoy one another, it's for better or worse. We get through it together for God's glory. Same as in marriage, you work your issues out for God's glory. The purpose of marriage is that God's name would be glorified. We work towards the, 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 His Word, which is the Bible, and we work towards His helper, the person of the Holy Spirit. So in Christ, and, and, and important, we, we kind of touched on it last week, but in Christ, our relationship to temptation changes. In Christ, our relationship to temptation changes. We go from sinner to saint. Our whole identity, our whole purpose, our whole being changes when we enter in as children of God. 
One works for self-expression. If you think of any of your own selfish sin, it's about self-service, self-protection, self-expression. Um, right? And the other is finding Christ's expression towards us. As sinners, we're called to define ourselves. As Christians, we're defined by Jesus who laid His life for us. It's a radical shift in, in our core identity as people. And, and, and He leads us in those paths for His name's sake, as we touched on last week. So carrying on. It was a, a sum of last week, but, but important kind of nuggets of truth. And, and, and this morning, it might be a bit jumped around. There's a lot of thoughts that I've tried to kind of pack into part two to get us to wrestle through, to give each of us nuggets to just say, that's what I needed today. That's what I need to wrestle through. That's what I need to study through. That's what I need God to take hold of and lay in my life. And, and, and it all kind of revolves around how Satan works to redefine good in our lives. Because cause today we're not preaching right or wrong, right? I'm trying to get to the core that, that from the fall, our sexuality was broken. From the fall, our work ethic was broken. From the fall, our health was broken. From the fall, marriage became more difficult. Because from the fall, they were naked and unashamed, and immediately they became naked and ashamed. Our self-image, our body image, every aspect of our lives was broken in the fall. And, and, and if we want to get stuff right, we need to put all of that in the same basket and say, God, you're at work in all of these areas in my life. It's not just about sexuality. It's about gluttony. It's about self-image. It's about all these things that are grouped together because of the fall. And that Satan works to redefine what is good in our lives, what is good enough as opposed to the greatness of God. And if he makes us question what is good and places the emphasis on, on, going, uh, on going with what we want, he is moving us away from Christ as king. Right? Sexuality is about who is the king of my body as a believer. Sexuality is about who is king of my body as a believer. It's not about what I feel and what I desire. So we ask the question, who was the second person in Genesis to use the word good? And it was Satan. The word good is used from Genesis 1 to 3, 14 times. And, and Satan in Genesis 2 or 3 or 3, uh, Genesis 3, uses it for the first time. And he uses the concept of goodness to tempt us to, to sin. And that's why Satan didn't come with these big horns and pitchforks and, and, and deceive Eve. He came with a gentle, still voice of manipulation, of, of, of um, empathy. To something greater, right? That niggling, hey, isn't there something more for you? Don't you feel like God's cheated you? Don't you feel like God's not blessing you? He's blessing everyone around you, but not you. Can we trust God? Can we believe God? That, that why would He give you these feelings if He doesn't want you to act on them, right? These are thoughts that play through our mind again and again and again when we, when we face either sexuality or sin or temptation or self-service even within our marriage, right? There, there's things that are, are mine and the still little voice is just saying, don't you think you deserve this? That's the subtlety of, of, of the enemy, that he takes what God has made for good and he mislines it for destruction. Again and again, most of what we, we pursue in our lives isn't necessarily inherently evil, but it's not defined good by, by God's standards. Right? He manipulates Eve to think that he has her best interest at heart. Right? And, and that's why it's so important to come back to the doctrine of the good, good father, the doctrine that God loves you, that he cares for you, that he knows you, that he made you, that he wants you, that he desires you, that he fought for you, that he sent his son to die for you, because that is where you find your worth. Satan will continually tempt you to doubt the, the, the sufficiency of Christ to love you, to redeem you, to rescue you. And we will always be pursuing some other desire, some other want over what God has for us. Right? And, and so much of how God intended us to be, to function, was broken in the fall. Right? I've said that. That every aspect of our lives, from marriage, work, health, and sexuality, and you can trace all of those back to the fall, everything became worse after original sin. Right? Everything after Eve ate the fruit and Adam was right there became worse for us. All, sexu all sexuality is damaged in the fall. We see this. Just think of some of your own sexual de desires that fall outside of Scripture. Right? And we're not going to put up our hands or pass the mic around. But growing up, even as you sit here, your, your sexually deviant mind that has wondered, even that culture would look at you as perverse. And God knows and He still loves you and draws and says, Jesus is sufficient. Right? Uh, our sexuality, it doesn't have to be same-sex attraction. It can just be a perversion of what God made to be good, which was sex, perverted by the world and by, by the devil and by sinful nature. 
We see that. So that's why as Christians we need to be so slow to throw stones or condemnation because we all sit in in a bucket of filth when it comes to sexuality. If we are not fully, truly redeemed by Christ Himself. Right? He says if you've thought about death, if you've thought about other women, you've committed adultery, you've committed murder. Right? Christ is kind of putting us in this boat that says, hey, something's drastically wrong with your heart and you need Christ. And you need a redeeming of Christ again and again and again. Right? And, and fundamentally, all disease is a judgment from God upon creation from, because of the garden. Any sickness that entered, any um, illness, whatever it is. And, and I'll touch on that in a bit or explain it. But righteous judgment, it's righteous judgment, not malice, revenge, or pity. Right? There's a consequence to our actions. God said, death will enter the world if you sin. Death will enter through destruction, through decay, through natural disasters, through sin, or through sickness, whatever it is. Right? And Adam and Eve are the only two human beings ever to be made or born, whatever you want to say, made, that did not have a corrupted spirit. Right? They had no bias towards sin. And and Scripture doesn't tell us why people that have no bias towards sin would still choose to sin. Right? It baffles me, and maybe one day when I get to heaven, that's one of my questions. On why on earth did you take the fruit? Because we all, we know we're born, right? When I was little, I stole Christmas trees, I stole money, I stole smokes, I stole cookies, I stole everything. And then I still lied about it and said it was my brother. (laughs) Right? My dad didn't teach me that. (laughs) If anything, he taught me the exact opposite. Yet ingrained in each of us is a sinful bent towards self-destructive behavior that if left unchecked leads to self-destructive adult behavior. Right? Again and again, a failure to grow up, a failure to accept responsibility. Adam and Eve did not have that bent, and yet they still chose to sin. And and, and I believe the same as Satan and the same as Adam and Eve, it's Proverbs 16 verse 18, gives us a little bit of insight. Proverbs 16 verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride, even as a believer, even as fully redeemed hearts, living for the glory of God, walking and functioning in what God has for us as believers, fully restored, fully set free, fully alive in the power of the Holy Spirit, pride will lead to our downfall again and again. That's why we see church leaders again and again succumbing to sexual pressures or or whatever pressures it is, and churches being damaged and destroyed because of pride. Right? Pride is the root of every sin in our lives. The, uh, um, arguments in marriages or, or children or being angry at your children for not listening. It's rooted in pride because we deserve better. I deserve that my children will listen to me. And if they don't, I'll shout at them <laughs> with a spoon. Um, but, but the idea is it's rooted in pride. Right? Yes, there's elements of obedience, there's elements of discipline, there's elements of love we see throughout Scripture. But a lot of our issues with our children, a lot of our issues with our spouses is rooted in pride of what we believe we are, are, are deserving rather than a humble submission to service. Right? If we're honest, if you think of most of the, the big issues you've had in your life. And... and, and Pride comes before the fall. Again and again, pride will lead us away from the things of God into our own self-destructive kingdom. Right? And, and that's a warning of Scripture, and that's a warning that we all need to heed again and again. Paul writes in, I think it's Paul, he says, Do not think you are beyond falling. Because pride is deceptive, pride is sneaky, and pride will destroy you. Right? And Satan will always build your pride. If you notice, that still small voice, which is normally either yourself or the devil. Sometimes we don't need the devil to help us be prideful. We're good at ourselves. Satan will always build your pride and your right to be who you want to be. And get what you want and do what you want. God, through the gentle moving of the Spirit and His Word, will call you to be who He made you to be. That's the contrasting views. The devil will always call you to be prideful and be who you want to be. God will call you to be humble and submit to who He's made you to be. And the problem is who God's made us to be isn't always up front and loud. It's sometimes quiet and reserved at the back. And we don't like that because we believe God's made us for something better. But it's just the lies of the enemy. And when God pronounced judgment on Adam, death entered the world. That's Genesis 3.19, Romans 5.12. All sickness from the common cold to cancer um, was part of the curse. And we, we live with that, that, that curse on the world. And, and thankfully... Jesus took that curse upon himself. I think that's what it says in Galatians. I think it's Galatians. Um, that, that he took the curse of the tree upon himself, which means we no longer fear death. We no longer fear what comes next after this. 
We can be a bit weary of how we get there, but ultimately we're going to heaven, we're going to eternal glory because death has no sting. But some sickness is related to spiritual things and, and, and sin, but that's for another time. Other sickness isn't. We don't know. And as Christians, we need to be very cautious. We don't pass judgment on someone based on what we see externally going or what's going on spiritually internally. Some sickness is just from the fallenness of the world. Some sickness is a spiritual attack. Some sickness is, is God's hand at work in some way we don't understand and can't fathom, but for His glory, His good. But ultimately, God is sovereign over all of it, and we do not know. It's why we walk very gently when we engage any sickness. We don't pass judgment. We don't pass opinion. We just simply submit it to the will of God and pray for God's divine healing and intervention. Sin can cause sickness. We see that. Too many donuts lead to heart problems. Amen. Um, lifestyle choices lead to sickness. It's not punishment. It's consequence. So there's consequences. You eat donuts every day for the rest of your life, you, there's going to be a consequence. Right? If you want to sleep around and live promiscuously and do all those things, it's going to have consequences on your life. Whether heterosexual or homosexual relationships, it's going to have a consequence. You can't just shake that off. You can't just sleep around your whole childhood or not childhood, but adult or teenagehood or whatever it is and then enter into marriage and say, well, I don't have any issues. We see that there's consequences. It's not punishment of God. It's the fulfillment that there's consequence to our actions again and again and again. And we are called to steward our bodies and use them for God's glory and make sure we, we are fit enough to be able to do what God has called us to. Right? And, and that's kind of the challenge here when we're speaking about sexuality and the brokenness of the world. Gluttony is the same thing. Because after I eat too much, guess what? I do nothing. Amen? Anyone eat too much and then want to go read the Bible or, or do something active? No. So gluttony, the Bible speaks about gluttony. We as a church never do. Uh, I've preached on it once, so I have once. Um, but it directly speaks to that. Laziness affects, uh, directly affects that. That's why the Bible says, don't be gluttons and drunkards because our behavior affects our ability to steward what God has given us for His glory. And it doesn't mean you're always on the street preaching the gospel, whatever it is, but there's a responsibility on us to maximize what God has given us for the advancement of His kingdom. Um, and, and we'll speak more about that probably when we do drugs or, or, or maybe. So it's there though. And we can all testify that the desires that we know are not, are, are not of God, they are destructive. Right? <coughs> and it's important to because the Bible does not teach sexuality as an expression, uh, or does not teach sexuality as an expression of identity. The Bible does not teach sex as a right or an expression to be who you want to be. Culture does that, right? Culture says you cannot be who you are unless you are free to sexually do what you want, how you want, when you want, right? That's our culture. Turn on any TV show, any program, that's it. The Bible clearly teaches sex in the confines of marriage as a blessing, as a gift, as an act of worship for married couples before God. Because our bodies are God's and sex is worship. If everything is of God, I know that doesn't sit right, but that's what I read. When I read Scripture, that's what I read, and I see clearly that our bodies are His. Romans 12 says, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, joyful and pleasing to the Lord. And, and an aspect of every good and perfect gift is from the Father above, who is there's no variation, James something something. Which means, sex given to us by God is meant to be used and stewarded for His glory. It's the perversion of the world and culture and of our sinful nature that taints it and distorts it even within marriage, then it cannot be used for God's glory. Right? That's Genesis 3, um, which I've read. But it said, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? It says you'll die. Satan is saying, can we trust God? Can we trust what God values as good? Can we trust God with our, with our earthly desires, right? That we're sexual beings. We know we're created with sexual desires, varying degrees for individuals. But what about the person that's called to remain single? Satan is saying you can never be single, you'll never be fulfilled. Scripture teaches you can have intimacy without sex. What about those that struggle with same sex attraction? Scripture teaches that you can be fulfilled and intimate with Christ and community without having sex. Satan would make us all believe that without sex, without marriage, we're worthless. And, and the church again and again in an effort to combat the, the sexual culture of the day says, well, let's just preach marriage because if people are married, then they're fulfilling God's calling. No, marriage is not a calling on, on, on people's lives, right? It's a blessing. It's great. It's awesome. It's hard. It's everything in between, but it is not a biblical mandate to believers to be married. 
And, and I say it all the time, and I know it's easier because I am married, but Satan comes in with a deceptive lie that you have no worth as a single person. Right? And, and we say it because when we speak to singles, when we speak to people, it's when are you getting married? Right? That's the first person. Or couples that are married when you're having children. Again and again, the subtlety of our culture is you have no worth if you don't have children and you're not married which is an absolute lie from the pit of hell to breed shame and condemnation on people that are not called to carry it. Amen. Amen. That's a sidetrack and a little pet peeve I have, but it's, it's biblical, so we'll leave it there. Because Jackie Hill says, she says, Satan wants to cast doubt on your sin and your hope. See what he does to Eve in the God. He says, is your sin really that bad? Is wanting to be God that bad? Is wanting to be happy really that bad? Is wanting to serve self really that bad? And actually, God's not actually that good. So what do you hope for? Why be obedient? Because God's actually just trying to be spiteful. Right? To view our sins as less than and the sufficiency of Christ is limited. Because both keeps us unrepentant. Because if we don't see the severity of the sin in our lives, why be repented of it? Right? And, and when one day we face to face with the person of the Holy Spirit through the conviction of the Word and, and, and God and, and we feel this burden to repent... If we have a limited view of the sufficiency of Christ, we won't because what's the point? I can't be forgiven. Right? How many of you carry the a burden of I cannot be forgiven? And that's again not scriptural. That's from the pit of hells. That's from the lie from Genesis 3 where, God, where, where Satan, is God really good? Is God really forgiving? Your sin's not so bad and God isn't so good. Doesn't that... Breed, doesn't that fill some of our minds, the turmoil of what we face when we struggle with sin or habitual sin or struggles? We're justifying our sins and minimizing the cross again and again and again. And we see that from Genesis 3 where we need to get the emphasis on sin is bad, sin is evil, sin is destructive, God is good and forgiving and redemptive. As long as there's air in your lungs, we can come in repentance and find healing and restoration. It might be a long process. It might be whatever it is, but it's possible. Right? And Satan elevates the beauty of what we cannot have. Do you notice that? You ever, who's ever been on a diet? How good do chocolates look? <laughs> right? You walk past the aisle, you're like, no, no, leave me not into temptation. Or the donut store, get behind me, Satan. That'd be a good name for a donut store, though. <laughs> um, I'd go there. But, but you see, what breeds, de what breeds death and destruction in the long term and makes us believe to be good and more valuable than Christ, right? Selfish desires mess with our ability to see what God has for us. Selfish desires mess with our ability to see what God has for us, right? Because, again, culture says sexuality is everything. So therefore, if I'm not expressive sexually, even within the confines of marriage, then what am I? Right? And we don't see that in Scripture. And Eve looked at, at, at what was beautiful. We know that the tree that she looked at was beautiful. It's Genesis 3 verse 6. It says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruits and ate, and she gave it, some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Again, right, the destruction of humanity rests on Adam and Eve. God places all responsibility on to Adam, and he was right next to Eve. So men who want to complain, well, why did Eve do that? We sat next to our wives, and we worshipped creation rather than the creator. And we do it again and again every day. We see that in Adam. But it's not what Satan, it's not what... Um, God intended, right? Satan manipulated that. Satan was changing the purpose of design for the destruction of humanity. This is really good. And I think it's Jackie Hill that po points it out, right? He was manipulating the beauty of creation to lead Eve into temptation. He was manipulating the beauty of creation to leave e lead Eve into temptation, right? We see this with sexuality because the tree was beautiful. It just was not meant to be partaken in. Right, you see it with, with same sex. You, you get bro crushes or whatever, your man crush or whatever it is, where I can appreciate the, the beauty or the strength or the awesomeness of another male, but it was never meant to be sexual. Right, where, where a, a woman can appreciate the beauty of another woman, but it was never meant to be sexual. It was never meant to be partaken of. We see that with David and Jonathan, where God knitted their hearts together. There's an appreciation of masculinity. There's an appreciation of vulnerability that we're called to have as a brotherhood, but it was never meant to be sexual. It was never meant to be partaken of. 
And, and that's where we see, even with, with um, women in relationship with other women, there's, there's a beauty to be appreciated, which we see by God's design, but it was never meant to be partaken of. Right? We see it with the beauty of sex. It was never meant to be distorted and degraded as we see in pornography. It was never meant to be used and abused outside of the confines of marriage, but it's crept in and culture says it's okay. Right? It was not created for identity, but our enjoyment and ultimately our worship. Our worship. Right? We were never created to define what is good and evil. We were designed to surrender to what God determines to be good and evil. Right, and, and I shared the story on Facebook, but I was going over my sermon yesterday. And I was sitting at the dining room table, and, and Benjamin's been walking around with a banana and an apple for about three days. I don't know why. But, but he comes to the table, and he says, it's my turn for TV. And Seth had just started watching TV. And I was like, no, it's not your turn. It's Seth's turn. And he takes his apple, and he throws it across the table. <coughs> and he turns and starts to storm off. And he can be quite stubborn, the little guy. He's cute, but he's stubborn. So I say, Benjamin, pick it up. Um, I don't even know if I said more than that. I was like, pick it up. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he gave me a stare. And I thought this was going to turn into a five-hour staring match. Um, but the Lord softened his heart, and, and, and he went. Um, and he picked up the apple, and he bought the apple, and he put it on the table. And he's still staring at me, and I can see he's mad, and, and he wants to fight me. And so I just say, I, I love you. I love you. And then Seth from the other room, the, the lounge, which is part of the dining room, he chirped up. It's hard, to believe, it's hard for you to, him to believe you love him when you shout at him. Right? Like, I shout at you. Give me that apple, Benjamin. Um, um, but, but, but I felt that, fortunately, I, I had a, a Holy Spirit moment, right? I had a Holy Spirit moment with Seth and with Benjamin, and I just looked at Seth was listening, and I said, trust the words of your father over and above the feelings of your heart. Right? Trust the words of your father over and above what you feel like in that moment. Because in that moment, you feel ashamed, you feel lost, you feel abandoned. But the words of the father is, I love you, I'm with you, you're mine, you're precious, I'm keeping you, I'm guiding you, I'm loving you, I'm disciplining you because I love you. Right? Because Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart, human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who knows how bad, uh, who knows how bad it is? Right from the inception of the fall, we judge our own desires, we judge our own wants over and above what God has for us. That's the whole point of the, the sexuality discussion that we're kind of opening up is, is how do we go back again and again to what God has for us over and above what we feel? See, the consequence of eating the fruit to follow in desires over God's words, right? Because Eve went with a desire placed there, placed before her by, by, by the Satan over the words of God that she knew to be true. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, that's Adam and Eve, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin, loin cloths. Uh, they were once naked and unashamed, and now felt shame before one another. Right? And I believe this is where consciousness of body came in, of ourselves, of our self-esteem, of our desire for worth, entered into the world, because before this they were quite happy with who they were. They were quite happy to walk around naked. They were quite happy just to be amongst the animals. As soon as destruction, or as soon as sin entered the world, as soon as decay entered the world, an inability to be content with their own bodies entered in. Right? And we can all testify to that, right? Who's actually happy with how they look? Right? It's from the fall. It affects our sexuality. It affects our self-esteem. It affects our, 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 our desire for approval. We see that for all of us that just long to be accepted, long to fit in. And that's one of the first things God says. He says, I love you as you are. I can, you can love me back because I love you. And, and we need to continually surrender our inward self to God's design and realigning and saying, God, I am who, who, who you made me, right? Not in my desires, but in my, phys in my physical being. Again, we need to steward what God's given us and be healthy and, and look after that. But we are who God made us to be. And there's a value in that, there's a worth in that that comes that, that despite the brokenness of the fall, I still have value, I still have worth, I am who God made me to be. And, and, and kind of coming back to that, coming back to um, our self-esteem is linked to a trust issue of the work of the Father in you. Saying, Lord, help me to trust in how you see me. Help me to see that you delight in me, that you love me, that you are good to me. 
And in every sin and repentant moment, it will require humility to admit God's ways. Um, His design is not always what my flesh craves and what my heart longs for. Right? Same as when Benjamin had to repent and pick up the apple and place it back on the table. He had to surrender his will to the Father's will. We can never have true repentance and changing of self unless we're willing to humbly submit that we need God. So how do we, how do we talk to, to people that are struggling with those or in sin or struggling and, and wrestle through? And it's just one point, really. And even how do we talk to ourselves, right? Because this morning we all have desires that are not of the Lord. May not fall under the sexual brackets, but we have things that are destructive and eating away at us that are not healthy for where God is leading us. So how do we grow a healthy internal voice? How do we allow the Holy Spirit to get louder in our lives? And, and essentially, it's John Piper says, stop talking to yourself and stop preaching to yourself. Stop filling your lives, not with culture or Facebook feeds or, or media as the dominant voice in your life. Make the Word of God the dominant voice in your lives. Whether that's through reading the Word, listening to the Word, whatever it is. But saturate yourself. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. <coughs> right? Because the sin makes clear we are sinful and broken. And that's kind of what I've been speaking about all morning. Right? We can all testify. If I say, who's got it all together and you still put up your hand this morning? You haven't been listening. Amen. We're all in that boat. We're all kind of broken in some way, some self-esteem, some whatever it is. But the scripture again and again, the starting point of Genesis and the starting point of, of, the new, uh, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is that God is creating, God is making, God is loving, God is um, inventing and in, um, intervening. God being God in all His glory, God pursuing even in the garden, God goes looking for His children. The emphasis again and again in Scripture, as far as I can read, as far as I can understand, as far as I can see, God's heart for us as a people is that it's a loving Father, not a condemning dictator. It's a loving Father, not a condemning dictator. And some of us need to shift our minds around what that looks like. And a loving Father would not leave His children in, in, in filth or decay or desires that are not for Him or not for the glory of God. Right? But we are created with worth because we are created in the image of God. So regardless of our sexuality, we have worth and reflect the image of God. That's why when we speak to anyone, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of social standings, whatever it is, it's done in a respectful, loving way because you're speaking to the image of Christ within them. Right? That's what James warns you. He says you worship God and, and curse His children. That's James 3 verse 9. That you're created. There's a worth. Genesis 1 says we're created in the image of God. So without a clear picture of the glory of God, we will never understand our sin. Right? We cannot start talking to the world about sin. We need to start talking to the world about Jesus. That's why I believe as a church, we, we don't want to, we, we know where we stand. We've got our sexuality um, leaflet that we printed and handed out, and there's more at the back if you need. We want to say, this is Jesus. He loves you. He's the Redeemer. The emptiness, the brokenness, the suffering, the abuse, the hurt that you felt, Jesus knows, and He loves you. And on, on, on behalf of the decay of the world, God apologizes to us. <coughs> have that idea. God doesn't apologize because He's wrong, but He's powerful enough to apologize on those that have offended you and, and beaten you and broken you and abused you um, sexually, whatever it is, and say, I am sufficient because Christ was enough. He knows the fullness of what Jesus went through on the cross to be sufficient to redeem and restore people back to Him. That's what this table represents this morning. That's where we, we're going in a few moments to come back to and say, God, I know that there's brokenness. I know that people have distorted sexuality. People have used it in, and, and abused it and, and whatever it is. And God's heart this morning is that He would bring healing, restoration, understanding in it. It might not be an instant release of, of, of whatever it is in your life, but it may just be God reassuring you, hey, I'm with you. Hey, I know. No one else in your life knows what you've been through. No one else knows what you've had to endure, the shame, the pain, the heartache. God says He knows and He's sorry. He's sorry you've had to carry that. He's sorry that you felt alone and abandoned in it. But, but the truth is you're not. God is with you. Right? That sin breeds the lie that we're unwanted, we're unworthy, and that there's nowhere to be found. The devil sells us that lie. God says, come to me.